subversion. My guess is, given given the time and given my um, uh, talk about enthusiasm, um, I will probably um, spend uh, all of the time on this, or, or nearly all. Um, the other has to do with sort of the debugging process and, and trying to um, trying to help you gain some sort of principled understanding how to go about debugging. Because it can mean the difference between 10 hours and one hour if you approach it right. Um, but first, we're going to talk about subversion. So, as always, I am grateful to you folks for submitting these, you know, every lecture, submitting feedback, what's clear, what's not on. And um, based on questions in person, based on some email questions, and based on the uh, sheets that you passed in last time. Uh, I have I've gained a sense of where some points of confusion are with respect to SDF. I've also gained a sense for what things you found in the last lecture really helpful. Okay? Um, so because of that, I sort of took stock of where, where we're at, where, where we want to go in the final lectures, and I decided this is really worth spending some time on. I wanted you folks to be really solid about some issues, and it's clear that my description didn't hit on um, certain points that are really important. So I, I want you to, to, to bear with me as I explain some gaps, some things that I left unsaid, um, and uh, fill in some details of results of ambiguities. Okay? So I'm going to be spending um, you know, somewhere in the order of uh, 15 slides of, of sort of material on, on SDI. Um, and if you have a good grasp of these things, it will put you in much better stead as a professional programmer, put you much better in stead for further classes, um, like 370, 371. And uh, it will also put you, ladies and gentlemen, in much better stead for the final exam. Um, so, let's, let's talk. I, I, I think between those, there should be some measure of motivation. Um, so, um, in this case, um, one thing that struck me that I didn't really emphasize, and I really showed up is most SVM, I just want to be cautious when I say most, SVM is a lot of things. The most common SVM communities, the ones you use day to day, in and out. Give me some examples of those. What are some common SVM communities? Update? Update is a great one. How about another? Import. Okay, so that would be used for taking the bunch of files that are here and, and putting them into a repository, right? How about uh, update would be used for what? For refreshing your files. Refreshing your files, great. Okay, how about some other ones? So those are good, two good examples. Um, update daily. Import less immediately common. I mean, you might use it every week or something like that. How about other commands, common commands? Copy is good. Another? Add. So adding a, a, a file, think a file. Um, another one? Check out. Check out, excellent. Um, so that, again, maybe once, uh, once a week or something like that, you're, you're going and you're checking out all the files in, in, in a repository, so that you can then go work with the repository, or piece of repository, okay? So um, others move, for example, right? And commit, okay, commit. There's others as well, but we'll be seeing. Um, so make or uh, delete, for example. Um, these ones listed here, add, copy, move, delete, make or. It's really important to recognize, when you issue them, you say SDI make or SDI delete. SVN copy, SVN add, SVN move. If you're doing them on your, your, your working directory, which is the most common place to do these, these changes, the fact that you've moved the files to change its name from X to Y, those will be visible to whom immediately? You and you only. Until you do what? Commit. This is a, it's an important thing to understand. You've got this little sandbox here. You can play around in your sandbox and try 
try to get your code in order, try to get it working. And during all that time, you don't want other people getting copies of your code because it won't work for them. Be halfway broke, it'll be you know, half broke, half working. Um, it will it will cause them lots of grief if they're working with that rather than the, the current version, which may have lots of stuff. So maybe there's a version of it that's all stubbed out. It does really straightforward things only. And you're working on the final version of it. You're working on the you know the real logic of it. You don't want them to get your stuff halfway through. After all, why not even compile right now? So the idea here is that you're working in your little sandbox and you're doing all these things. You're saying SDM add, add this file in to the repository. Great. But it doesn't then go expose that to someone until you say, okay, now I'm ready to share this with the world. And the way that you say I want, I'm willing to share this with the world is with an SDN commit. It's an SDN commit. So those things all get kind of batched up. Oh yeah, this is final to be added to the repository. And oh yeah, you know, um, this modification has been made to this file. And this one's been renamed. And this one's been copied to a different one. This one's been deleted. All that gets kind of patched up on your little sandbox. Just paying attention to what you're doing, as it were. But until you tell it, go release it to the world, it's not going to expose you that way. Okay? It's only when you say, okay, this thing is consistent. It's it's working, you know, I have great confidence in it. It's worth it's worth uh, other people, you know, working with it. Then you say SPM commit and all that stuff. Okay? Now, I use some weasel words in there. Um, and uh, the reason is that there are versions of these commands. Add, copy, move, delete, make sure. That actually operate in the server. You can actually tell it, and you don't do this day to day nearly as well, certainly. Um, but you can actually tell it, hey, actually do this copy on the repository. Actually go right now on the repository and make this change that everyone can see. You can tell it, delete this file on the repository right now, wipe it out. You, you can't actually do that. But for the most part, we don't. For the most part, we want to have a consistent set of changes that are mutually consistent with one another, that, that are logically sort of matched to one another. You know, we delete, we rename this file um, to this one, or we copy this file, we do some fixes on it, maybe then we delete the original. And we want those, all those changes to be visible at once. <laughs> in a commit. And so, for the most part, we do it on our local copy and then we say commit and it all gets seen by the world. Okay? I, I just want to be clear on that. It's at that commit that you're saying it's ready. It's ready to be shared. Mm. So, um, another question that came up from students was about SDN add and import. What's the difference between SDN add and import? Can anyone comment on that? Import is first time. Yeah. Import is first time. You're actually saying, okay, I want to add all these files into the repository. Uh, I want them to join the repository project. And you could do it with a whole group. And it commits immediately. Whereas SDF add, it's an incremental operation. Often you can do it on one file or small number, and, and uh, it won't be seen by other people until you fall into the commit. Okay? And SDNF has to be done from a working directory. Something that you've already done. A, a, what sort of thing makes it a working directory? The fact that you've done a checkout. Check yeah. Uh, that's what will typically make it a working directory. And SDNF is done in the context of working directories. SDN import does not require a working directory. In fact, the examples you've seen typically don't have that working directory. You say, import all these files into this repository, and then later we'll go create a working directory somewhere else with them. Okay? So these are different, different things. Um, SDN add is used uh, day to day much more than the import, but import has its place for sure. Any question on that? Okay. Um, 
There are some other points I want to emphasize here. Um, and if you're working with subversion in a serious way, like you live with 371 and maybe 370, um, you want to know that there are certain distinguished names, what we call in computer science identifiers, alphanumeric names, for certain points of record. These are certain revision numbers in the repository. So we talked about how if we have these repositories, We have successive revisions of uh, number, and those number that number need always, not always be contiguous. So, for example, we might have a uh, a trunk branch, and it has sort of successive versions uh, or successive revisions in it as people, for example, do commits. So there might be you know two sixty eight. 269, but at some point there may be an SVN copy done, and we have a separate branch going on, maybe for release for a different customer. And, you know, maybe this is 270 here, maybe this is 271, you know, and 272 occurs here, and this is 273. Um, so the result of this commit is state 273 of the whole repository, the entire repository. When this guy was committed, it was state 272 of the whole repository. It would have to do before the state was committed. So if you went and looked at the repository at this, for this um, revision number, you see the files in a certain state. If you looked at it after this guy was committed across the entire repository, you, you see the files in a somewhat different state as reflected by whatever was checked in here, et cetera. So we have these kind of revision numbers. And some of them have special names, and these names are typically are commonly taken with respect to a working directory, but there's, uh, there's one called head, which is the latest revision of the repository. So maybe, you know, the last revision that's taken place is, um, you know, maybe this is 274 here, and this is um, 275, something like that. This may be the last thing, the, the last check-in that took place, and if we looked at the result of that check-in across all files in the repository, Files over here in the main trunk, files over here. Those files could be a certain class with certain contents, right? You all appreciate that? After I do that check in, whatever this check in is, I could go and I could say, hmm, what's the content of every file in this repository? What are the file names, right? I could do that. Yes, yes, I could do that. I could go and I could look, oh, okay, there's this file, is that content, this file, is that content. And it might be a bit different from what it was back in 274, because of some changes here, but every file would have a certain state, and I could take a snapshot of that, and we call that snapshot 275. That's the version of 275. That's the head version right now. That's the sort of current version of the state repository across all things, okay? Um, so we call that head, H-E-A-D in caps, okay? Um, and if we do an update, we do an update, um, say in our little working directory, the files that we get will be files from that version of the process. It's the latest version. So that's what we'll do. Okay. In our version of integer.c that was in there. Okay. Now, in a working directory, there's some additional names that we have. Um, and you can take these from a file or multiple files, but basically they're they're an indication of the version of the, uh, of the given file that we're modifying. Like, when was the last time it was updated or checked out or committed? The previous state prior to that in the last commit version we did, the last time that was, uh, that was committed by ourselves or, or, other, or, or someone else before this, this, this base version that we're working on. The, you are not responsible, ladies and gentlemen, for these on the one day, okay? I do expect you to know about head. Sort of that's the name for the latest version of this whole repository. Version 275 has a certain contents of all files and certain files there. That's, that's the head, okay? These other guys, turns out these are really useful if you want to do more subtle things with that, um, with, with subversion. For example, you might say, hey, get me the, pre the prev version, the previous version of this certain file um, that was
sort of the version before this latest commit that I got, and that will help bring that in. But you're not responsible for that. Just be aware that there are ways to name these things. Kind of the, the version before I started modifying, that's what base is. The version just before that, previous, the, sort of the, the version that was in there before, before this one was added, before the base was added, and, and you know, the last committed version uh, before, before base. Okay. So you should be aware that it allows you to sort of name these things, you're not responsible. I made some muttering in the last lecture about SBF annotate. I sort of said it could be used to, to, to annotate some information, and I realized I really should have gone into that in more detail. Specifically, ladies and gentlemen, what it allows you to annotate, what it, what it annotates, what it does, it performs annotations for, is in a file that's checked in, it tells you for each line in the file what version of the repository, with what version of the repository that line came into being, and who introduced that. Does anyone know an alternative name for SBN annotate? It's another name for it. And it reflects the presence of names here, names of the users who are responsible for each one of the file. The other name by which it goes is SDN blame. <laughs> the idea is if you see a certain if you see a certain line where it says, you know, A plus plus where it shouldn't be, it will say, honestly, you know, and, and you say, okay, um, uh, you know, the, the, the prop the prop screwed it up or something like that. Um, so so SDN annotate can be used for any given file say, okay, so where did this line come from? Who was the last one who touched this line? Who was the last one who modified this line? And when did they modify it? What version of the password? Was it way back, way back here? Or did they do it you know, more recently? If we're looking at the ancestry of this file, rules.txt, when did these different pieces of that file come in? And how far back do we have to do to go to find that particular line we're interested? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, FVM blame, the, um, it, it, it's a humorous thing, but the, the truth is here, there's not a lot of room in software projects for just blame. What we might want to do is we might want to go talk with that person, find out um, where this misunderstanding came in, but we also might want to find out what they were trying to achieve by that, and uh, did they try it other ways, like why did they think this would work, were there other cases in the program where they found something similar? Um, there's lots of good rules, the reasons why we might want to identify a person because we want to go talk to that person and, and find out where this is coming from and prevent it from happening again. You know, find out, was it a miscommunication between two programmers? Were they simply um, sort of recreating the version as of many versions ago, which had that same thing in it because, you know, that's the latest version they had on their machine or what have you. So, so here, having this ability to identify line by line where the contents of this file, from whence the contents came, and from when they came in, that's a very useful um, thing. And so SVN Annotate is an extremely useful tool in as much as it gives us the provenance, the origin of the different components of the file. Are people comfortable with that? Can, see, can you see why that would be valuable? Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, other things that I think could be points of confusion. SVN update. I've all, I have repeatedly referred to SVN update in the context of updating your current working directory against the latest version of the repository. And that's great. You want the latest versions of the files from other people so that you can work against it. That's the most common need. But ladies and gentlemen, there's another use to it. Which, uh, in which it serves to obtain uh, versions of a given file or set of files from a previous revision. Yeah. It doesn't have to just be the, the head. It doesn't just have to be the latest one. That's maybe 90% of cases. But sometimes you want to actually get the version of this file as it was, you know, two weeks ago on a certain day or the particular version that was checked in just prior to the client's demo that was successful. I want to get that version because I know that worked. Hmm? So you can go 
know that in get a previous version there. It's not restricted to updating the latest version. Make sense? Okay. Okay, there's another one. There's another one, SVN verb, right? It sort of referred to this. The idea here is that we can tell it, hey, look, I got this file on my on my machine right now. Maybe GUI.c. GUI.java. Um, and I want to apply some changes to this file that exist that were applied between certain versions elsewhere in the repository. So maybe, ladies and gentlemen, I'm over here in this branch. Maybe I'm at number 273. And meanwhile, since I branched this thing, there, there are these changes which occurred over here with the trunk that were fixing bugs that were held in common. Maybe I want to reproduce those same changes over here in 273. Hmm? I want to, I want to get that, that goodness of those changes. What a student in my 371 class might have uh, several years ago, he would refer to things like that as the chocolatey goodness of the, of, of these changes. Um, so if you want to enjoy uh, what David Bush now calls the chocolatey goodness of these changes over in this other branch, you could tell it, hey, merge in the changes that were applied between versions 271 and 272 into my, my current, my current uh, version of this file. And it will go and sort of get those changes and apply them to your version of the code. How does it know what version, what change in here, what thing? Well, because it keeps differences between you know, each successive version, between 270 and 271, et cetera. And it can figure out, OK, what change between this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy, et cetera. Okay? Um, so here, we can, we can actually go apply changes from previous versions or from other versions of it back into our code. And we can also do this option called minus dry run, which basically rehearses the process without actually doing it. It tells us what would be changed, what would result from it. And that can be useful to make sure we know if we're actually going to do it. Yeah. OK, so it, it becomes, so after that merge, that would be present in your working directory as you're in your sandbox. And other people won't see that in your code yet, because you haven't yet committed. But when it comes time to commit, that's when they would see the result of that. For now, it's just what you've got in your little sandbox. Does that make sense? Yeah. So an FDN update would get the, the version as it existed in version 272, for example. And you may have other things in here that you, after you did this branch, you may have modified it in other ways, right? And you don't want to just stomp on those things. You actually would like to be able to get, perhaps, the changes that went on between 271 and 272, but you want to combine those with your changes as they exist here. So you don't just want to get wholesale in version 272. You want to apply these the differences between 271 and 272, that particular line that was added to correct the typo, you want to apply that to your 273. Your 273 might have had lots of other changes since version 270 in other areas of the code. Does that make sense? This is pretty integral advantage of using the brand system. It is. It is. The ability to, to um, to go and sort of uh, apply those um, those uh, very specific surgical changes into your particular code, splice them in, as it were, without just saying, give me the old version and let me do it by hand. No, it can do that automatically for you. I think the word that's used for it by members of your generation is sweet. <laughs> My generation might have called it slick. I don't know. That's so good. Is that, is that so you? Okay, okay. Oh. Okay, so uh, final thing I want to talk about along these lines is SVN revert. SVN revert rolls back your changes to the latest repository version. This Pursuant to the question, to the question there, this is much more similar to just doing an 
SVN revert can be used to just do a wholesale sort of rollback. There was a question about tagging. And I noted last time that a tag denotes a snapshot of the repository. Okay? Um, it's a snapshot at a certain time. So these are the version 0 files. These are the versions of the files as we gave them to the uh, demo from Merrill. Right? That's sort of the snapshot of the system as it existed at that time. Now that is different, ladies and gentlemen, from a branch. Because a branch is the site, the locus of ongoing development. For the branch, we create, you know, we have the, the trunk, and then we have a separate version for our potential big sale, or our big, you know, big client that's asking for this customization. And we, or maybe we have a, a new version which we're undertaking. This is our original version, and we have a new version that we're undertaking, and later we're going to merge it back in. The point is a branch is a, is a location where we're doing un, where, we're, where we are undertaking ongoing development, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and in that ongoing development, um, we're going to be creating successive, uh, successive versions of the repository. By contrast, the tag is just a snapshot. It just sort of a way of capturing the state of the system as it existed at a certain moment. Um, now, in contrast to some other systems uh, that are out there, within SVN, uh, a tag is maintained by convention. So, uh, SVN tags are maintained by and large by creating a tags folder and performing a cheap copy to that uh, uh, to that um, uh, to that location. And then that copy is simply never modified subsequently. Okay? So the idea is that we have a tags directory and that tags directory gives us the various snapshots associated with a little bit of content and we periodically, if we want to create a new tag, we do so by doing SVN what? SVN copy. Pretty good. Do it by doing SVN copy. And copies, and ladies and gentlemen, in SVN are cheap. Why is that? I said this earlier, but and I, I made utterances to that effect. But I'd like you to uh, repeat for me those utterances or approximation there too. Um, so why is copying cheap? And why do I say copying is cheap in SVN? You got it. It doesn't copy the data. Doesn't copy the file. You may have a Mongo database or a very large scale set of data associated with, you know, text text for your application, um, and you can copy that a hundred times into different places and only modify one line of it, and it will be very very small incremental cost. By contrast, if you copy the entire bits every time you'll be consuming a lot of space. So here, we're, we're basically storing, we're saving, we're, we're um, representing things by differences. Differences between successive, say, versions of the file, etc. And within different versions of the cluster. And if we do a, if we implement a tag, we basically have a tags folder, a tags folder of our file system. So maybe we have a, a trunk, for example, in our, our SBN repository. Here's the trunk, and here's the branches, eh? and here's the tags, and maybe we have underneath the tags a version 1.0, 1, 1 and we have a version 1.5, and then we have a version 2.0, and then we have, you know, the um, Merrill Lynch demo or something like that. Um, each of these, we do a copy to it from the trunk, perhaps, SVN copy, and after that, it just left, it just left sat. We don't do any further development of this. It's just an SVN copy of the state of the project at the time that we designated the trunk version 1.0. Each of these costs virtually nothing because they're not copying the final contents. They're copying the fact that it's the 
same, you know, integer dot c here is the same as the integer dot c at version 268 of the of the repository with the following changes. None. You know, so, so basically the same as that. And similarly for each of these guys. And so we're getting essentially no cost, these sort of tags. But we can always go back to this and say, hey, give me the state of the file system as of version 1.0. It, it lets us play semantics, place metadata associated with it. That, oh, these are in version 268, we like to call it version 1.0. Kind of a nice way of doing that. So here, this is our tagging, ladies and gentlemen, in SDN. Now, like a lot of things in SDN, this is by convention. Is there anything that prevents us in the tags directory from doing further development here? No. It won't. It won't slap us on the wrist for doing it. It won't realize something is awry. But it's it's by virtue of our convention, our discipline as software developers, to realize tags is for static snapshots. End of story. So. We have to use this copy. And it's the fact that there are cheap copies in SPM that makes it possible. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So, um, having said that, I would like to, one of the, the nicer pieces of feedback that I uh, received, uh, and very helpful pieces of feedback that I received from, um, from people here was the fact that you, you found it really helpful last time a kind of step-by-step, command-by-command, blow-by-blow account of certain SDN processes. And because that was helpful to those in the audience, I thought I would, uh, I would go through a, a similar step with respect to a process that's perhaps a bit mysterious based on my previous comments, but absolutely central both to the day-to-day -day operation with, uh, well, in software engineering at large, and your work with SBM. And in fact, it relates to a key desirable feature of SBM, namely the ability to kind of go and uh, to go and discover when there's a conflict instead of just stopping on someone else's work for it to proactively tell you, hey, there's a problem here, you need to fix it, because your code, the, the, the particular things, the particular lines you modify will interfere with the the, the changes that somebody else already made to those particular lines, and you've got to fix it. Okay, you'll flag it. How does that happen? We're going to see it right now. Okay. Um, so you folks probably remember there's this notion of copy, modify, merge that we introduced during the previous lecture, and these were with some diagrams that were very helpfully part of that red bean book to which I referred you. You may remember this little example with Harry and Sally. What I've done, um, because of the feedback from students about what would be helpful, I've annotated this with the commands that would be involved in this. How would, how would Harry know that there's a conflict? How would he fix that conflict in SDN, etc.? So let's talk about this. So the first element that this starts with is uh, there's a repository, and the repository has some, some latest version. Latest version of the latest snapshot. It has some particular files with some particular content in its latest state, right? Great. Um, and maybe Harry and Sally are both working on the trunk. And they both do an SBN update to get the latest state of a certain file. Maybe it's map.c to display a nice little map. version and it gets the latest version. Okay. They then go and they modify it. Each of them is working on it. Maybe the other, each doesn't know the other is working on that. It's not. Sally is doing some core logic having to do with the, the um, uh, updating of the uh, global map and the local map of uh, some of the logic and Harry's doing internationalization um, uh, modifications. Um, so he's doing some edits associated with some of the strings in there or what have you. OK, 
Okay, so that's great. Each is making modifications, but there's w one or two lines where Harry's actually doing something on the same line where Sally made me modify it. Okay, so um, here, unbeknownst to Harry, Sally goes and writes to commit to her code. How did she do that? To an SVN commit. She uses SVN commit to commit her code so that, because she feels that it's to the to the point where it's worth sharing. To the point where test is worth other people getting involved in testing. It's not going to break other people's code if they're using hers. You know, they're going to be able to still run the program even with, with her latest changes. So <coughs> she's got her changes at a level, she's got to a level of confidence about her changes, she feels you know other people can benefit by them, not be hurt by them. So she she does an SDN command. Places her changes officially in the repository, which will allow other people, if they do an SVN update, to get them, for example. That's great. But meanwhile, Harry's been working on this stuff. And he goes and he tries to do an SVN command. But what happens here, ladies and gentlemen, is that, and you can read in, the, in, the, in that SVN read the uh, reference of the exact sort of syntax of how it tells you, but he does an SVN commit. And it will say SVN commit failed. And it will say that the file is out of date. What does that mean? Well, that means that he's been working off a version of the file, and his changes are such that they clash with hers, but they're, they're working off a version of the file that's now been updated. In other words, the one in the repository is now more recent than the version that he's been, he's been uh, operating off of, okay? So there's this conflict, and it's specifically a conflict with respect to the lines he's dealing with. Okay, so what does he do? Well, the first thing he does is he does an SVN update. Now, you folks might be shocked by this, because you might think, quite understandably, that SVN update will simply stomp on his changes. It'll get the latest version, which is Sally's from the repository. And his changes, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, you might think disappear, right? Do you not share my trepidation? Speak, youths. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we stay in a good company. Um, okay, so. You might think that's the update. With trembling hands, you might type that. Because you might think that all that work that you've gone into as Harry in that internationalization exercise will be well then lost. But in fact, SBN, ladies and gentlemen, is smarter than that. What happens in the SBN update is it realizes that there's a problem. It realizes that there's a conflict. And so what it does is it creates it doesn't just update that file, stomping on his changes, wiping them out in paper and salads. Instead, it creates a fact for files. Not one, ladies and gentlemen. Not simply updating one, creating four. And what are those four files? Those four files are a version of, of this code, which interweaves his changes and Sally's changes, shows where there's a conflict shows where his changes say to do one thing and hers said to do something else. Secondly, it gives a version of his code alone. So notice that map.c is the one with interleaved changes. It includes both, and it's going to force him to, it's not going to be a legal C plot. He has to go clean it up to say, OK, in this case, I prefer this one. In that case, I prefer that one. Use this line for this one. Okay, it's showing both in there, and it has There's a map.c.mine, which are, is his code, before he did the necessity of update. So he need not have had those trembling hands. He need not have brought to it that tremulation or that trepidation, that wariness or that fear. Because his code is preserved in map.c.mine. Okay? That's his file before the merge. And then there's two other files, map.c.r, this is going to be some number, it's going to be the base. This is the file before any local changes were made. This is the file before he made his changes. And then there's a, a version of it that's, that's purely the one that's out of it. Purely the one that's the latest one from the possible. So he has these access to these four files. And, and that provides flexibility as to how to approach it. He can go and look at Sally's file as a whole, test her 
chosen file as he judges uh, in a mature way to be best. Having done that, having edited it, make his version consistent in some way, he's going to do two things. He's going to use this command svn resolve. Why does he have to do that? Well, because svn knows that there's a conflict. Svn had marked, when you did an svn update, it said there's a conflict here. There's a, see the c prefix, it, it, it actually says hey, there's a conflict, you got to fix this thing, and that's why it created these files. So it knows there's a conflict. And so before it views the situation as clean, as, as having been corrected, as suitable, as fitting, it requires that you issue an SPN result saying, hey, look, this file has been cleaned up. I know what I'm doing now. Now I want to commit it. OK, and then we can do, oh, oh, oh. You can do it. This is, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna resolve this. Excuse me for a second, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, I'm gonna resolve it, and then I'm gonna commit it. Um, okay. Uh, so so SPN commit, and SPN commit then puts it back this A star, which probably merges his changes with Sally the way that he judged best, hopefully by talking to Sally as well, and. And that goes up the repository. So that merged model. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we've seen here is a situation where, um, you know, it's been smart enough to realize that you can't just stomp on Sally's changes. That there's actually a genuine conflict down to the line level. There's there's a conflict here, and and it helps us through SVN update in adjudicating. It helps us in kind of making sense of that conflict, sort of uh, figuring out what particular lines come from what particular people, what things Sally changed in her latest version, what things you changed. It doesn't just show, ladies and gentlemen. You, you do have options to the version at, that Sally created, the version that you created, but you have access to it in this map.c It'll let show line by line with the file. Most of the lines are typically not things that are an issue. It's just there'll be a couple of them that Sally modified and a couple that you modified, and some of those will be the same lines often. And you're gonna need to adjudicate, you're gonna need to adjudicate on, on those, those conflicts. So it greatly simplifies how much work you have to do in terms of, of figuring out you know, what this, how to resolve, how to adjudicate properly, how to resolve the conflict. So um, following his uh, commit, after doing that resolve, what will happen then is that, SV, uh, that Sally will do an SVN update. And she can get the latest version of the code. In this case, it's code which incorporates both her changes and Harry's changes. It's, it's that mix that, that Harry identified hopefully after talking. She can do an SVM update in, in shape shape. So this may not seem this may seem like a pain rather than a um, rather than a virtue, but believe me, if you've ever been in a situation of having a, a team project where one person's working on the same file as another, and you have this kind of race in situation where both want to contribute at about the same time. This is about as painless as it gets, in the sense that you have a very concrete need to identify, okay, you've made some changes, I've made some changes, how are we going to make sense of them jointly? Um, and there's a lot of support for that that SVM gives us, particularly with this interleaved version. And as I said, in the Red Bean book, you'll find uh, to find actual syntax for this interview version. We'll kind of point out these are the lines you modify, these are the lines that, that Sally modified. Okay? 
So this is the concrete steps you would go through to resolve this conflict. And this is this is a reality, maybe not day to day, but week to week in software conflicts. You don't have these sort of conflicts day to day typically, partly because of division of duties within a team, partly because it's unlikely you're going to be um, you're going to be modifying things sort of at the same time, you know, periods during the day. If you have people checking their stuff in pretty frequently, um, but this is a uh, a situation which can occur fairly frequently, and SVM helps us with that. I want to also emphasize one other thing, ladies and gentlemen, having to do with test-driven development, which is the desire for frequent uh, frequent um, uh, frequent checkups. I think one of the things which should be obvious to you, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that we had this conflict in the first place was a reflection of the fact that Harry and Sally were editing these files for some period of time in parallel. Let me ask this, ladies and gentlemen. Is this type of conflict more likely to occur in, in one situation where Harry and Sally are each modifying the file, need to modify a file for two hours each before checking in. Versus if they, in other words, if they work on it for two hours before checking in, they do it. That's the an update before they work on it, they work on it for two hours and then they check it in. Um, that's not a situation. Versus a situation where they do an SBN update, they work on it for a week. And then they check it out. In which case is it more likely to be a conflict? Mm -hmm. The week. It's far more likely that sometime during that week, when Harry is editing this file, map.c, that, that Sally will have some need to modify it as well. If, if Harry only has that file for two hours, it's not nearly as likely that Sally will need, or for that matter, that Sue or Barbara or, or Sam during that same time, right? It's not nearly as likely, it's a much shorter time. So, these sort of conflicts can be lessened, mitigated, reduced, if we have short periods of, of editing and we check things and we commit things frequently. Do people understand that? Do you appreciate that? If we're committing things frequently, if Harry was committing, if Sally was committing code frequently, and Harry was committing code frequently, any one little set of changes they're doing in their sandbox will be less in duration for time. Therefore, less likely to be in conflict with someone else's. Before Harry, if, if Sally were checking in her changes six times a day, and Harry wants to go update his, and he's checking in frequently too. He might be working on for half an hour. He had gotten Sally's latest changes as of you know two thirty in the afternoon, and he checks his in by three. There's far less likely to be conflict with this one. And if it occurs, it will be with respect to far fewer lives in that code. So this sort of situation benefits from frequent check-ins. And test-driven development is, desi is designed in part to facilitate that. So here, we're making commits on a frequent basis. Maybe we add a unit test, we add the code to pass the unit test, we find any bugs, we make sure that it, it, it works, and do any fix-up to, to make it pretty. Remember, the person doesn't work. And we make it work, and then we make it pretty, and then we check it. Hmm? Hmm? Possibly we can check it in after it, it, it works a little pretty, but hopefully you can pretty fly a little bit, and then you check it out. And you don't leave the project in a non working state. So you, you check it in once it's it's solid and working, and you know that because it passes your, your unit test. And you do this perhaps several times a day. And this reduces that risk of a conflict, or if there is a conflict, it'll be a smaller conflict. Do people get that? If you check in frequently, conflicts will be less frequent and smaller. If you check in frequently, conflicts will be less frequent and smaller. Mm. You can hear it one more time on YouTube. Um, 
because you may hear it one more time on the final exam. Okay? Um, okay, so it's, it's a good thing with a capital N, a capital G, and a capital T if you can keep these things <coughs> coming as far as commits of code that's really solid and workable, test driven development helps that. Those are two different best practices. They're not two solitudes, they, they, they combine together for a very powerful methodology. Continuous integration and test driven development. Okay. Um, and typically, ladies and gentlemen, when someone checks them in in those sort of systems, it will run an entire build at the time of check. It'll actually do a compile automatically and warn us any errors. Okay, the final thing I wanted to ask that, that I just wanted to comment about, and this will uh, literally have to take just a couple minutes here, had to do with a question that I received from a student concerning commits that, that you want to undo. Suppose there's a commit and you realize that actually it was, uh, had problems. The commit to map.c had some faulty logic and I want to undo that. And the question was, can we undo this in subversion? And I indicated yes. Um, and there's two levels of depth of that answer as to whether we can undo changes. So the recommended way, suppose we we had a, instead of change, maybe we made some change way back when, maybe in version 268, this change. And now we realize, oh, there's a problem with it. We're way up here and, and, and we're working, you know, in this period and we realize there's a problem with that. What can we do? How can we, how can we fix this faulty logic? Well, one thing we can do, certainly, is, is we could say, well, hey, this, this, this introduced, version 268 introduced some particular change to some particular lines of, the, of certain files. I could ask it to undo those changes as a, that were part of 268 and make it as if none of those changes had happened. In other words, maybe it changed you know, lines 10 through 15 of this of file A and lines 5 through 6 of this other file. I could tell it here, you know, hey, undo all those changes and and uh, you know keep all these changes which have occurred since then, and then I'll check that in its version 276. Mm -hmm. So here it's as if the changes that contributed to 268 were were gone. Another case is you know we, we check something in here and we are working on it, and then we realize oh that check in was bad. The changes that were part of this were bad. We could roll those back and and then do a new check-in which has none of those changes. Um, and we can do so by this syntax here, svn verge minus c minus 101. They basically means, hey, in my code that's in front of me now, my working directory, take away all of the changes that were introduced by version 101. Wipe away, undo those changes. Those, were, those changes to lines 10 through 15 of version A, of 5 through 6 of I'm oh, sorry, file A and five, uh, line five through six of file B. Take away those changes that were introduced in, in 101 or changes to this particular file. They can just undo that. Boom. Um, in our file, and then we check in. That's, that's a sort of straightforward way. Now, what is not recommended, it's possible, it is possible with tools to do it, but it's highly unrecommended, <coughs> would be to say, we're going to go back and edit, edit history. And we're gonna we're gonna delete history. You know, in the Soviet era of the of the of Russia, um, they would take pictures sometimes, and they would actually go back and like cut out cut out arms or, or insert people who weren't there, etc. And go back and edit. These days it's done with Photoshop, but they would actually do it with the actual things. And some people found that in some of the images, um, they insert like extra arms of people celebrating when. 
said, this is not revisionist history. Instead, what we want to do is correct for it, check in a new head, a new most latest version of the repository that's that reliable. And we can go back and we can indicate that this version is unreliable, do not use, or something like that, to, to, to indicate to it that it's, uh, that it's uh, you know, not a, a stable thing or not a, that it has problems or what have you. Um, so anyway. Can, uh, you can expunge, but it's not recommended. But the most recommended thing is to undo and then check in. Okay? So that's all for today. Thank you very much.